you know, because I did the proposal in 2019 <laughs> and because of COVID, I couldn't come in 2020. And in between there, I had also written a proposal for the Arizona Commission on the Arts um, to get funding to start working on this notion of what I call looking back to move forward then and now or then and now looking back to move forward and I kind of switch them back and forth every once in a while. But for the grant that I got from the Arizona Commission in the Arts to start it, it had to do with a visit to West Virginia, uh, Appalachian Mountains where my mother was born because I wanted to see what it looked like then, meaning using the archives from the 20s and the 30s, and then what it looks like today. And then to do a series of uh, paintings along that line and then leading into coming here where I would continue that notion of looking back to look forward. Um, so when I came, I was a little bit, um, okay, uh, how do I get started on this? Uh, I need a model, I need a female model. Um, you know, what is she gonna be looking back on? Uh, and I said, oh my God, I need to read. So I started reading about the history of New Mexico and particularly the history connected with the Pueblo Indians. Um, and that, that was difficult for me because it was hard to find something positive because one, one of the things I had said in the, in the proposal was that I wanted to look back on something positive that then propelled women forward as opposed to something negative, which we seem to always do. Um, and so after reading about two books, going to the Museum of Native American uh, Culture and Art, um, I decided to focus on pottery. I think we, a, lot of, a lot of times we think of our achievements as having to deal with, with negative things that made us who we are today. But I, th I think in reality, there's a lot of positive, positiveness within the things that happened to us in the past. And I think that too often we look at the negative. And when we look at the negative, I think what it does a lot is it drudges up angst, it drudges up fear, and, and then that fear, yes, it may help us to prepare, propel ourselves forward into something good, but it's like we, we nurture it. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of like I have a friend of mine who, you know, when I started painting and, and she was looking at my work and she says, well, you know, you really should, you know, dig deep in your roots and your family. And, you know, and, you know, and she quote me a couple of African-American artists who, who were working on things like slavery and this and that and the other. And I told her, I said, I don't really want to do that. Because while it's a good thing, I'm not saying that these people have done something bad, but while it's a good thing to do that because it brings it present to other people, I don't want to dwell on the negative. I want to dwell on the positive. So, you know, even the, the, the trip to, um, to West Virginia with my mom, you know, in the end, we found the old church where she used to go to that brought her joy and happiness. And that's one of the first paintings I, I've been working on, which you'll see when you get into the studio. My art journey really, if you, very, very beginning was when I was seven. Um, I started drawing and I did a drawing of my mom and it actually looked like her. And so my mother was, you know, pretty excited. She was like, oh my God, it looks like me. Um, and I, you know, and from that point forward, it gave me something special, you know, a, a special feeling about myself. So for Christmas presents and birthday presents, when they would ask me, you know, what do you want? It was always art supplies. But yeah, and then I majored in art as an undergrad. Um, thinking that, you know, I was going to be an artist and my math teacher suggested I go into education to make sure that I am able to put food on the table. So I took the track towards education and in the end, I graduated with a, uh, a BA degree in art, uh, in painting and drawing. My intention was to do my MFA because I had decided if I wanted to teach, I didn't want to teach high school. I wanted to teach something bigger than high school. Um, I didn't have money to go to a private art school, but I had been to France my junior year 
and I really enjoyed being in France. And then, of course, I was already in love with French painters like Cezanne and Manet and Monet. And so I, I went to France after I graduated and went to the National School of Art, um, stayed there only one year because I did not like the way their program was, um, moved over to the Sorbonne and wound up getting um, not an MFA, but a master's degree in, I guess you would call it education. I'm not sure what exactly what it was. It was plastic arts theory and aesthetics. Uh, and so I continued on to the PhD <laughs> and I wound up getting a PhD in the same discipline of uh, plastic arts theory and aesthetics, but it was so art history oriented that when I came home, I would tell people, well, it was kind of like art history and theory, you know, that kind, kind of combination. But behind, in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be a painter. I wanted to paint full time. And so after about 27 years of teaching and being an arts administrator, I decided it's time. <laughs> and so here I am. Um, I think part of it is, yeah, art historical. A lot of the artists that I admired, as particularly the French artists uh, in the realism period, um, they were doing genre paintings. Um, and I just, for me, it was, I wasn't interested in, I mean, I do landscapes, but I wasn't interested in just being a landscape artist. Um, and I think that Painting people, it's like a part of history. I mean, yeah, it's a part of history, but it is through that that we learn history. And I think while I was in, in the field of art education, I taught a lot about what a work of art can reveal to us about that culture and that time period. Because the things that you can capture, how they're dressed, what's behind them, what's in front of them, the make of the car, you know, someone see this painting, I don't know, in 50 years, they'll say, oh my God, that was done. Oh, look at those cars. Looks like, look, look, look at what they look like. Oh, what, that's the way the people used to dress. That's what interests me. <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Richard Diebenkorn when I was an undergrad. He was at UCLA, which is where I was. I did two um, independent studies with him. He never really showed me any of his work, but he would talk me through what I was doing and tell me what I needed to think about, you know, as I was, you know, pulling this painting together. Um, so he was, I, I'd say, in terms of a person-to-person -person kind of influence, because um, outside of him, then it becomes, you know, historical people or contemporary artists, you know, who, who are working. And one of my favorites today is a woman by the name of Zoe Frank. She's young. I don't know, Zoe must be in her early 30s, somewhere around in there. Um, she studied art very early. Um, when I say very early, I mean she studied in an academy when she was like 16, 17 years old. She went to Europe, she studied there, and she, she lives in Colorado. And I have never met her, but I came across her work, and I've just been kind of like following her ever since. And her paintings are enormous. You're talking about eight foot by four foot. And what's exciting about that to me is that um, so often men get the glory of being the artist and doing the huge paintings that go on the wall, you know, kind of thing. And here's this young woman who's just, I say, outpacing, you know, any man that I have seen in terms of her art. Any woman that I know of or can find who has been able to, in spite of all of the economic challenges, family challenges and that type of thing, um, to be dedicated to their art to the point that they can make their living, ah, that's, that's, a, that's a number one. Well, I never started exactly in the same way. Um, depends on the size. That's number one. If it's a small piece, I might sketch in with the paint and it becomes a la prima. If it's, you know, like I, I, 
have done like these little seven by seven pieces, which I finish in about two hours, two and a half hours. Um, and then sometimes when it gets a little larger, it depends on whether I'm painting outside or if I'm all in my studio, but if I'm outside, for example, and I'm doing a landscape, again, I will sketch it in with a paintbrush and then you know lay in my, my darks mainly and then go from there. Um, when I'm in the studio and I'm working on a larger piece, I will generally draw it out in more detail, um, sometimes with graphite, but I'm preferring to do use vine charcoal and then I'll block in and then it'll take me, you know, that series of time to eventually build it up into, into what I want it to be. I'd say any female visual artist who has been successful from all the way back to the 16th century with Gentileschi, Artemis Gentileschi, all the way up to current with Zoe Frank, um, with the in-between, some photographers like Carrie Mae Weems. Um, just, it's really any female who has ma managed to get through what a female has to get through as a visual artist, because the, the ground is not equal. I have, um, a friend of mine that I had met when I was teaching at University of Arizona, um, Barbara Rogers. And um, Barbara Rogers taught at the U of A. She also taught, I think it was at the San Francisco Art Institute for a while. Um, what I appreciate about her the most is that she was able to combine the business knowledge with the art making. And so she has been very successful. She's now retired, but she is as productive as ever. And so that kind of a person who, who really commits themselves to their craft and does what they have to do and is able to stand alone. I mean,